She's going to sing a very special song for us.
It's a song that um, you're all familiar with, and it's a song that I needed this week, and so maybe you need it too. downstairs to uh, junior church at this time and for the rest of us open up to what I would consider an, an obscure book in the Bible one that we don't typically uh, look to or look at and that's the book of Ecclesiastes the book of Ecclesiastes it has somewhat of a negative tone but really with a positive message Ecclesiastes chapter number one. I want to talk to you today on this topic, God Matters. I know that there's a uh, program out, uh, Money Matters. It's a play on words because money does matter. But then, of course, there's Money Matters are taking care of the things about money. And so there's no real play on words here. God truly does matter. And that is the point that the preacher is giving us here, who happens to be King Solomon. So let's read the first couple of verses, and you notice it starts right off on a very negative tone. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, and that of course would be Solomon. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man of all his labor which he takes under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also arises and the sun goes down and hastens to his place where he arose. The wind goes towards the south and turns about unto the north. It whirls about continually and the wind returns again according to his circuits. 
All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, there they go or return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing which has been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under heaven or under the sun. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, uh, for this book. And I know this book is quoted by many cults and many atheists because of its negative tone and seemingly as though it contradicts the rest of the Bible. And while that is not true, we thank you, Father, for this book because it does teach us a valuable lesson that life without God is a futile thing. It is an empty, meaningless endeavor. So, Lord, thank you for revealing to us this truth. Thank you for showing us how important it is to find God in our lives through Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so here King Solomon is showing us, uh, if you will, through the course of the entire book, what he tried to do in finding happiness, meaning, and uh, I guess happiness and meaning in different endeavors in his life. And so he tried building orchards, he tried uh, pleasure, he tried, he had uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines, 700 wives, uh, that in itself would be an adventure. And so he tried all of these things, drinking, getting drunk, uh, pleasure, he built orchards, he built buildings, and he discovered that, you know, with, without God, it just all seems meaningless because I build and just one generation comes and the next generation goes. And uh, it's just an endless cycle, like the sun rising and setting again, endless cycle. And it just seems to go on and on and on without rhyme or reason. But then we need to realize that Solomon is no atheist. He knows there's a God. And as we get into the book, you realize that many times he said, listen, just enjoy what God has given you and know that he is the author of all these things and be content with what you have. And so here we find, as we begin to read, that there's a frustration that immediately comes out and that's what he is, he's frustrated. And he says in verse eight, all things are full of labor, man cannot utter it because it's just... You work, you work, you work, and it just never ends. And so it seems quite futile. Um, Eden wrote this, what then is the purpose of Ecclesiastes? It is an essay in apologetics. It defends the, a life of faith in a generous God by pointing to the grimness of the alternative, that is life without God. And so while Solomon believed in God, we know that he fell away from God, particularly because God said, don't marry outside the nation of Israel, outside the covenant people, and uh, of course, one wife for one man for a lifetime. But here he's saying, or here he disobeyed God and he amassed to himself 700 wives. You imagine taking care of that um, household. And so here he is, obviously stressed out in the fact that I've tried all of these things and life just seems empty, seems empty. What more can I do to find fulfillment in my life? And so in verses one through seven, I'm gonna put observations uh, of observing the world or observations from the world. And so what he's saying is all of nature returns to its former place, but once a man dies, that's it. The sun rises again, the wind comes back again, but once we die, that's it. Well, we know that's not it, and that's the blessing. So nature runs its course. Uh, again, Eaton said this, creation rings with the praises of the Lord. Creation is his. But says the preacher, take away its God, and creation is no longer reflects his glory. It illustrates the weariness of mankind. And so what he's saying is that everything comes from the hand of God. And when you take God out of the equation, it becomes meaningless. Now, here's what science is striving to do today. 
we must find water on other planets because we believe in evolution and we believe life starts in water and so they're desperate to find water on other planets to put some meaning into life that that must be the way life started here as well as other places so they're looking for evidence that life evolved on planet earth and as you know they've discovered a little bit of water here and there and it shouldn't surprise us because the Bible says in the beginning was a big ball of water and then that big ball of water God creates the earth and what happens to the rest of the water well it just spreads out into space and I think God used it to create stars and other planets so it shouldn't surprise us to find water elsewhere but we know that every other planet we go to in our solar system every planet is dynamically different every planet is different now Neptune and Uranus they're somewhat similar but generally speaking planets are quite different because it's showing the glory of God it's showing that God can God doesn't have one kind of planet he has many kinds of planets in fact Paul says in the book of Corinthians that one star differs from another star and we've learned yes there's red stars there's blue stars there's white stars so God loves variety there isn't one kind of butterfly there's hundreds of kinds of butterflies it's not one kind of bird there's many kinds of birds there's not one skin color there are many skin colors because God loves variety so here this man is observing the wor world and he says you know everything returns back again it comes back again it's very methodical uh, it runs its course and here's the positive side of that that nature is predictable so while he's looking at it as a negative boy the sun rises again but when I die that's it isn't it nice the sun rises every day isn't it nice that we can count on Christmas being on December 25th every year isn't it nice that things do run their course because God created us to have a sense of um, order that's why we're all flustered like this clock says it's only seven after ten so I actually have another 55 minutes to preach <laughs> so there is a positive side we can count on the Sun being up tomorrow we can count on things and that's a good thing but now notice verse number eight as we move on here or actually yeah uh, verse number nine I'm sorry he says this the thing that has been it is that which shall be and of course in other words that which has been in the past shall be in the future and that which is done is that which shall be done in other words somebody accomplished something in the past the same thing will happen in the future people build in the past people will build in the future people love in the past people love in the future but notice and he ends up by saying this there's no new thing under the Sun so whatever has happened in the past will happen in the future it's just cyclical life just seems to go on and on and on there's no rhyme or reason that's the negativity that we see but I want to remind you of something quickly and that is there's one new thing for people that come to Christ you say what's that well number one we gain a new name so in Revelation 2 17 it says that someday when we see the Lord he will give us a new name there there's an old hymn there's a new name written down where glory. in glory there's a new name written down in glory so there's a new name that we're going to be given and then of course we have a new nature do we not in Christ we have a new nature we want to please the Lord we want to serve him we want to uh, glorify him if you will and then of course we have a new community I remember when I first came to Christ as a 27 year old and um, I started mentioning to my friends I was going to church and this that and the other thing and then of course I stopped doing uh, the things you shouldn't be doing in the 60s and I won't mention it because there's children in the room I'm just looking at you but the kids are over here but anyway um, <laughs> so 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 as soon as I stopped doing those things guess what happened to my friends they stopped coming around but you know what God gave me brothers and sisters in the Lord and that's better than a fair-weather friend somebody's there to get something from you 
So now I have brothers and sisters in the Lord. So we have a new community. We have a new commandment. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. So we're supposed to love each other. And part of that is, are you ready for this? Putting up with each other. Amen? Amen. Putting up with each other. You say, well, that sounds kind of negative. No, it's a reality. We just, we love each other enough to say, okay, boy, that person drove me nuts or what they said I didn't like. Or, but we put up with each other just like when you have an argument with your wife or your husband, you don't just say, that's it. I'm leaving. I'm never coming back. Because there's a love that's deeper than the aggravation of the moment. Does that make sense? Now, if you've never been aggravated in the moment, if you've been married, come see me, because I'd like to know the secret of that. <laughs> What's the secret of that? So, uh, so we have this new commandment, love one another. And of course, we have a new covenant. The new covenant Jesus, uh, or uh, the Father, God the Father gave in the book of Jeremiah says, I will make a new covenant with my people. I will write my law in their hearts. So we don't need, we don't need Ten Commandments on stone anymore. It's in our heart to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not to take his name in vain. To keep a day separated unto the Lord. We keep Sunday, of course, the resurrection day. And uh, in the Ten Commandments, it was a Sabbath day or Saturday. So that's new. Then we have this new nature, as I mentioned. Then we're new creatures, uh, new creatures in Christ. And uh, in Revelation 21, 5, it says all things will become new. Someday when Jesus comes back, the curse will be lifted, the earth renovated, if you will, and he will rule and reign as he pleases. And so all things will be new. So I just thought in the middle of all this negative stuff, there's nothing new under the sun. There are some new things in Christ. Now, what do you mean there's nothing new under the sun? Well, the idea is, you know, people say, well, computers are new. Rockets are new. No, computers are tools that people created. People created tools in the past. They're creating tools in the future. And so it's the same thing. Uh, greed, love, that was the same in the past, it's the same in the future. Nothing new under the sun. People have ambition, they want to get ahead in the past. Same is true, nothing new under the sun. People have ambition and want to get ahead. So there's nothing new under the sun as far as humanity goes. And then, notice in verse um, 8 through 11, and start in verse 10, because we already picked up uh, 9 here. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? And of course, I just answer that, no. It has already been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. You say, what's that mean in plain English? Well, if I took just the first part, there's no remembrance of former things. That would be for most of us above the age of 40. I don't remember where I put my keys. I don't remember that word I'm trying to think of. I don't remember where I parked my car. Um, but that's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is that when we pass off the scene, the memory of who we were quickly vanishes away. Not very long ago, I, a name came up that they had, they had named a building after somebody, Margaret somebody, I forgot what her name was. And at the time I thought to myself, before I started getting into this book for today, um, I thought to myself, so who's she? So the reality is you can name buildings after people, but after a generation or two, nobody knows who those people are. And the way they're rewriting history in our, in our public schools today, people aren't going to remember who Samuel Adams is. He's not a guy that invented beer. He's a man who was one of the founding fathers, if you will, or George Washington, or, and you name it, and they're just erasing history, tearing down the statues. We don't want to know who these people are, and that's a shame. But the point is, no matter how famous you are, there are very few people that really live through history. In fact, of the billions of people that have ever graced the planet, we could probably only, we probably only remember a couple of hundred, you know, Julius Caesar, Plato, Aristotle, 
whoever, Martin Luther. And so these are names that rose to the top of history and remain there. But consider the billions of people that have come and gone. We don't know who they are. Not at all. In fact, I don't even know who my great-great-grandparents are. They came from someplace in Italy, and so I don't know who they are. So uh, that's the idea here. So the idea is that Solomon is observing first nature in the first several verses, and then he's observing mankind here in these next verses down through verse number 11. So he observes, observes mankind, and he realizes, you know, I'm a great king, and I've built up this temple unto God in my house, and I have all these riches and wisdom. And he's thinking, who's going to remember me? Now we do, because it's in the book. But if we didn't have a Bible, would we always know who Solomon was? Well, that's, uh, I guess, a good question. So he's working on this negative side of life. Now let's sum it all up here. Verse number 12. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This is a sore travail. This is hard work. Has God given to the sons of men to be exercised there with? So Solomon is saying this, and I want us to look at a few uh, phrases here, but he's saying this. He considers the exercise of gaining wisdom and knowledge a sore travail. Why? Because it seems so meaningless to him. In other words, I go through all of this labor and work to discover something, to find out something, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. Or it just goes on and on and on, and it never ends, it's cyclical. And so he's kind of down in the mouth. But I want you to notice a few verses here, or a few phrases here. And that is, if we go down to, um, or, or verse number 13, same verse, go down to the second line. He says, I gave my heart to search, uh, to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done, that are done where? Under heaven. Under heaven. Now let me say this, in this particular book, there are some phrases that teach us this is the meaning of this particular book. So things that are done under heaven, in other words, not including God, things that are done on the earth. The other phrase that we start out with in verse number two is vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In fact, I believe 39 times that phrase comes up in this short book. I jotted it down 37 times, I'm sorry. Vanity, and of course vanity means emptiness, purposeless, uh, purposeless living, a wasted life. Vanity of vanities, I've done all this. And what meaning does it have in the end? I pass off, somebody else takes over, and after a while nobody even knows who I am. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, or empty or purposeless, if you will. The other expression that word you saw is under the sun. So that's man's viewpoint, not God's viewpoint. So here's a man who is experimenting with all these things, and we will get into it uh, maybe next week, some of these other chapters where he talks about uh, planting orchards and building buildings and uh, you know drinking himself drunk and all of these different things to find meaning in life, to find happiness, to find purpose. And so he said, you know, not only is it vanity, but the other option is that under the sun, it's, this is my viewpoint. There's no rhyme or reason to life. So what he ends up saying really is, what the message title is, God matters. Life has no meaning without God. It's just cyclical. This generation will pass off 100 years from now, none, none of us will be here. Well, maybe a couple of us will be here because by then they'll invent brand new hearts or something. They'll just give you a brand new heart, brand new kidneys, brand new liver and you'll live to be 150. But boy, you're going to be wrinkled. Because <laughs> they can't give you new skin, I don't think. Well, there's cosmetics. So, 
But the, the reality is, uh, generally speaking, 100 years from now, every generation passes off the scene. And there's a whole new generation, all new people, if you will. So there's those two expressions. And then there's this expression. By the way, under the sun shows up 29 times in this short book. And then uh, half a dozen times he says this, I said in my heart, so I thought to myself, that's how we would say it today, I thought to myself, this is what I was thinking. And we'll see that here in a second. So here he's kind of summing it up, if you will. And uh, if we drop down to verse number 14, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. There it shows up again. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. In other words, it's just a hardship. The more I have, the more headaches I have. Anybody ever notice that your house constantly needs maintenance? Anybody ever notice that? You know, you, you, when it's brand new, it looks great. It sits there for several years, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, I got to repaint this, or oh, there's a crack in the concrete here. Oh, this, I, I visited, uh, who did I visit? Oh, I visited Paul yesterday. And his front lawn, not that Paul has to mow his front lawn because he doesn't, um, was really tall. And I thought, boy, that's, that's pretty good looking grass. It was all grass, not too many weeds. It, was, it needed to be mowed. But I thought, why does my lawn look like that? I'm always envious of other people's lawns, by the way. <laughs> because the more I try to make it a lawn, the less it becomes lawn. I finally planted grass that, it's called zoya grass. It dies every winter. But every spring it comes back and it doesn't grow very quick and it's thick as a carpet and it's green and no weeds can grow in it and I barely have to mow it the whole summer. I can't wait till my whole lawn is like that. Now it's gonna take from now until Jesus comes back, but <laughs> hey. So here, the point is that it's sore travail no matter what we do. We've got to repair things. We've got to maintain things. We've got to fix things. Every church wants to be larger. You know what larger churches have that smaller churches don't have? This is not a trick question. It has more people. You say, well, yeah. And with people comes what? See? You all know. So... Yes, we want more people to come to Christ. We want more people to love the Lord. But with more people come, more because people think differently. Different ideas, different things, how things ought to be done. Um, all right, let me skip that. Verse number 14. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. In other words, life has no purpose without God. There's no purpose. So when science is teaching our kids in public school that we evolved and we wonder why and we teach them, you know, we're just animals, we came from animal life, we're just animals on the planet, then we wonder why are people acting like animals? Because we kick God out. Instead of teaching everybody they're responsible to God. Now whether they accept that reality or not, if the culture by and large is God-centered, then generally speaking, the culture is much more stable. And we are living proof that when you take two or three generations and teach them there's no God, we are living the results of that in America today. Amen. The cities are burning. Uh, there's more division now than ever. Uh, there's racial division. By the way, there should be no racial division for a Christian because God loves souls. God doesn't say, what color are you? God created, and I've said this already, he likes variety, likes variety. So people come in different colors. Aren't you glad they don't come in purple and green? So. Now look at verse number 18. Verse number 18, we're gonna skip right here to the end. For in much wisdom is much what? Grief. And he that increases knowledge increases what? Sorrow. And the same is true in the physical realm. The more we have, the more we have to fix. The more we have to maintain. It's just a reality. I know uh, Liberty University, um, they bought uh, this huge building. 
Uh, this is many years ago, and of course they have lots of buildings. And I think to myself, the nerve of them to charge so much for admission. And the same is true, especially here, we have uh, you know, some very world famous colleges right here in Rhode Island, Brown University, if you will. Um, uh, I was gonna name our community college, but I was thinking that's not world famous. <laughs> but, any, but anyway, so you know, Providence College and et cetera. So um, why, why do, how do they have the nerve to charge people $40,000 or $50,000 a year or a semester, whatever it is up to now? A student, to teach, for a kid to sit in a class and listen to a teacher, well, I'll tell you, half that money is going towards maintaining all those buildings that are there. I mean, they've got to fix those buildings. And guess what? They have to hire people to fix all those buildings and maintain those buildings. So it's this vicious cycle, if you will. And so that's what he's saying here. And so he's saying on an emotional level, yes, much wisdom brings grief. Because what you realize is the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. The further out we look into the heavens, the more we say, boy, I want to look a little bit further. Just a little bit further. Why? Because the eye is never satisfied. The eye is never satisfied, nor the heart, if you will. So the more the preacher understood life under the sun, the greater his despair. The more he learned, the more he realized what he didn't know. The more he knew, the more he knew life's sorrows. And so a very negative turn that happened to this man. All right. So truly, there's an emptiness without God. I have this uh, book that somebody wrote. I love the guy who wrote this book right away. And in this book, there's a illustration. And uh, I'm gonna give you the illustration, but I wanna read something first. Um, this is, uh, there's four kinds of hope uh, that I put in here. The first kind of hope is a futile hope. It's a futility. In other words, your hope is not based in anything factual. It's not based in reality. And so part of that uh, segment is this. Such a bleak outlook on life strikes the same chord as expressed by King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Known for his great wisdom, Solomon states his own futility in trying to find gratification and meaningful living apart from God. The pursuit of his objectives without God carried him into the realms of sexual pleasure, excessive drinking, construction projects, cultivation of orchards, amassing wealth, and multiplying servants and wives, none of which he discovered satisfied his soul. His endeavors only led him to ask, what's the point? Is it any wonder he declared time and again, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There's a man, we'll name him Tom. And Tom was a businessman. And he got caught up in the, the, the rut of life. You know, wake up every morning, go to work, everything's the same. It became mundane, it became drudgery, it became boredom. And he decided to quit and find the meaning of life. So he quit his job. And he worked at finding the meaning of life. And he came to hear that there's a, a Lama, if you will, a, a, uh, like the Delhi Lama, and so not the animal Lama, this is one L, okay? This is one L, not two Ls. And so there's this uh, guru, if you want to use that term. And so he heard that this Lama was on a mountaintop in Tibet. And if he could just get to that man, he would tell him the meaning of life. And so he set out to go to Tibet and to climb this mountain. And so when he finally gets to Tibet after his long flight, he meets a man uh, who tells him this, it's this mountain and the man lives on top of the mountain, but first you must fast for 40 days and then you must climb the mountain. And of course it's a hard trek and it's arduous, but you must climb that mountain on your own and get there uh, to that particular man. So, the, so this man, Tom, fasted 40 days, and then he begins to climb the mountain, and indeed it was difficult, it was hard, it was cold, and he had to do it alone. 
But he finally claws his way to the top of the mountain and he sees the llama in the distance. And he's in a little pagoda type uh, structure, if you will, and he's sitting there and he's, his eyes are closed, he's meditating, and he approaches the man. And after a few minutes, the man opens his eyes and Tom says, I'm so glad I've come. I've heard that you can give me the meaning of life. I've come all this way to find out the meaning of life. And the man closed his eyes. And a few minutes more, he opened them up. And this is what he said. He said, life is like a river. At which point Tom said, what? Life is like a river. I traveled across, the, around the world. I climbed this mountain. I fasted for 40 days. I've done everything I could. And you're telling me life is a, like a river? And the llama shrugged his shoulders and said, okay, life is not like a river. <laughs> the point is, he didn't know the meaning of life any more than anybody else does who doesn't know the true and the living God. And the true and the living God is our creator. And he gives life meaning. There is no meaning outside of God. There is a, let me tell you a true story. By the way, that story of Tom's not true. You knew that, right? Okay, all right. But this is a true story. Eric Lindell was the front runner, no pun intended, in the 1924 Olympics to win the gold medal in the 100-yard dash. I mean, this guy was Reese Lightning. And so he finally made his way to the Olympics. And what he knew was this, that the 100-yard dash was happening on Sunday. And because of his conviction, because God mattered to him, he said, I'm not going to run the 100-yard dash. And he crushed the spirits of Britain and Scotland. He was from Scotland because they thought we will win our first gold medal. And he said, I'm not running. Not only did he not run the 100-yard dash that he was undoubtedly going to win the gold medal in, the following week on Sunday, he was supposed to run the four by, you know, the, the baton, you pass the baton. And so the relay race, he was supposed to run the 100 yard uh, or the 400 meter, I'm saying yard, 400 meter uh, relay race. And he didn't run that either. So what he did during the week is that he said, I'll run the 400 meter race. Now there's a vast difference between sprinting and running 400 meters in which you have to pace yourself. And so, the man who was destined, not destined, the man who was supposedly going to win this 400 meter race, his coach said, listen, don't worry about Lindell. Don't worry about, because, or Liddell. Don't worry about Liddell because he's a sprinter and he will just die 50 yards from the finish line. He just can't keep up that pace. And so, sure enough, during the week, he's on, on, on the uh, starting gate. By the way, he also had the worst position. He was on the outside lane. Now, the problem with the outside lane is, as you know, everybody else is behind you because the outside lane starts way up because you have less distance to cover, if you will. So, or not less than, you have more distance to cover, so the other guy's further back. But... Here he's got, he's way up front, everybody's behind him, and the gun's fired and he takes off. And he starts with his sprinting pace. And he's sprinting and everybody's going, he's, he's just gonna, he's not gonna keep it up. He can't keep it up. Not only did he keep it up, but when he drew to the finish line, and apparently this gentleman, Eric Liddell, had this strange way of finishing his races. And that was, he just kind of threw his head back and his arms flailed and he just kind of put his chest out and he ran for the finish line. It was a strange sight to see, they say. And so sure enough, as he's approaching the finish line, he goes into his arms wailing, head back, and he picks up speed. 
the crowd's on their feet. They're screaming and yelling, and sure enough, he finishes 15 yards, or meters, that would be 39 inches instead of 36, ahead of the man who was supposed to win the race. They said, what did you say all that for? Because he still won a gold medal. Now here's what happened when he was going toward to ready himself for that 400 meter race. He was in the locker room or wherever the uh, runners were getting ready, he was putting on his sneakers and a man passed him and handed him a piece of paper. And he put his sneakers on, laced them up and the man of course took off and he opened the piece of paper and on the paper, it said this, and he quoted 1 Samuel chapter number 2, verse number 30. The note said, the old book says, and the old book being in the Bible, the old book says, he who honors God, him God honors. And so you honored God by not running on Sunday, and God will honor you. And he did, he won a gold medal. He, nobody ever expected him to be able to run. In fact, his body was so exhausted, he really um, didn't win any other races the, the rest of the year. I mean, he really taxed out his body. Now, 1 Samuel 2.34 actually says this, For them that honor me, I will honor. Says the same thing. To honor God. So for Eric Liddell... God mattered so much that he was willing to give up a dream of winning a gold medal. Wow. How many sports figures that are Christian today, and some really are Christians, would be willing to put aside Sunday for the sake of the sport? Well, I know this. I don't see any football players saying, I'm not playing on Sunday because that's their work day. Now, we don't follow a day like the law, the Sabbath. By the way, a year after the Olympics in 1925, he finished uh, Bible school and became a missionary to China. And the Japanese invaded China during World War II, as you know, and they committed all kinds of atrocities. And Liddell had to send his wife and his child back to Canada, and he stayed. The Japanese eventually put him in, in an internment camp. And just a few months before the end of the war, he died of a brain tumor. Now, why did I say all that? Because here's a man that gave up a gold medal because God mattered to him. What, what are we willing to give up for God? How much does God matter to us? I know how much God matters to me. God said, go to Pasco, Rhode Island. And I came to Pasco, Rhode Island. Now, I got to tell you, the town looks much better today than it did 30 years ago when I got here. It has Dunkin' Donuts on the corner. <laughs> That's better than the old broken down mill that building that was there. And of course they redid downtown and that's nice. There seems to be fewer bars around, that's always good. But the point is, how much does God matter to you? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. So here this man is saying, you know, life is just, it's futile, it's meaningless, it's purposeless, it's empty, there's an emptiness to life. Yes, there is, unless you have God. Now we try to fill that emptiness with entertainment and music and ambition and running around, always doing something, staying busy. Some people can't stand their own skin. So they're always doing something instead of just relaxing and enjoying what God has given us. So how much does God matter to you? That's the point I want to make today. So let's pray. Father, we come before you and I pray that you would matter above all things to us. Because you give rhyme and reason to life. There is no purpose to life without God. If truly we evolved, then indeed we are part of the animal world. We're just animals. And there is no rhyme or reason for life. 
And if that's true, then why do we have laws? Why do we have police departments? Why do we have governments? Where did that come from? Well, Father, the evidence is quite clear that indeed, if we truly started out that way as just animals, we wouldn't have civilization as organized as it is. It would be total anarchy. And we seem to be gravitating towards that even in our nation and probably around the world in many places. Because a godless society is a society with no purpose, no rhyme or reason, no meaning. Well, Lord, the meaning here for us today is to glorify you and to worship you and to love you, to sing praises to you. And so, Father, I ask that in each of our hearts, you matter the most. And of course, our family members we love dearly, we'd give our lives for them. But in the end, we will pass off this earth and we will spend eternity with you. So Lord, help us to enjoy what we have. Help us to know there's a rhyme and a reason for what we have. That you place into our hands the things that are part of our life. And that gives it meaning. For now we become stewards of what you've given us. We're the managers. You own everything we have. Lord, it's your car. It's your house. It's your business. We're just managing it to your glory and to your honor. Is there somebody here today who would say, Pastor, God has not mattered to me really that much, and I would find it hard to believe because you're here on Sunday, but I don't know your heart. I don't know your heart. But maybe with uplifted hands, you say, Pastor, God needs to matter more to me. He's just kind of on the fringes of my life. I just kind of added him into my life as one other thing. No, he needs to be the thing in the center of your heart. To love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's somebody here today who said, Pastor, that's me. God needs to matter more to me. I know that. Would you pray for me? Anybody at all? Uplifted hand? I see that hand. That God matters more. Anybody else? Well, Father, you know our hearts. We don't have to really raise our hands at all. There's no hiding from you. You know, our every thought or every motive. And that can be a very frightful thought. Except for one thing, that Jesus Christ went to the cross for us, died in our place, took our sins upon himself. And so his righteousness has been placed upon us. But Lord, for this one person whose hand has gone up, I just pray that you bless and encourage and let the Spirit of God lead and direct in their life. Give them wisdom. Give them the courage to walk the way as they need to walk, if that's the issue. So Lord, thank you for this book. It seems very ne negative on the surface, but the truth is that through this negativity, I guess Solomon is using reverse psychology in a sort of way in which he's saying, listen, Life is so negative without God. Have God. And we see that in the book. In fact, at the end of the book, he even says, this is the whole duty of man. And that was to love God. So Lord, that's the first commandment, to love you. Help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray it through Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, let's all stand and sing. If you'd like to come and pray, if you all can, feel free to do that. You've got to put that down. Oh. Here I am looking up at the screen, wondering why the words aren't up there yet. All right, we're going to sing Because He Lives this morning as our invitation. As Pastor said, you may come and pray at the altar if you uh, wish. They call him Jesus. He came to love. He ran for good. He lived and died. You died, my father, and 